All right, guys, welcome back to the BBR podcast. I'm ecstatic to introduce my guest from New York City, Meredith Shirey. How are you today? Hey, I'm great. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and your practice there in New York to, to spend some time chatting with me. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for the invitation. Absolutely. Um, now, I've known, I've gotten to know you a little bit through my research, but um, how is it and why did you choose uh, your career path as a marriage and family therapist? Oh, wow. Let's see. How many hours is, is this going <laughs> to? As many as it takes. <laughs> right. I'll give you the, the Cliff Notes version of this. So, um, so I've been practicing now for, I think, six or seven years. I've been in private practice uh, for about a little over three years. Um, and I got into this, I started becoming more interested in relationships and in psychology. Um, in my later teenage years, my parents got divorced when I was 16. And, um, you know, I got to be in that, that lovely space of being the oldest child. So getting put her right in the middle and, and figuring out how to mediate adult conversations, um, you know, some efficacy there. And then saying, okay, you know, maybe I can go into a career in psychology, uh, getting into school and as a lot of 18 year olds do, right? Psychology seems like an interesting major. You don't really know what you want to do with it. Uh, ended up taking a couple years off because I needed to figure out what I'm actually going to do with this. Went back to school uh, after having a job where one of my close work friends would constantly tell me about her relationship and she kind of jokingly say, oh, this is a great therapy session. And I realized I was like, you know, I don't hate doing this. I actually feel really energized by talking about relationships and talking to people about where they're at and helping them to see maybe the other side of things. And so then I went back to school and decided to pursue counseling, uh, went to grad school knowing that I wanted to work with couples, um, and then pursuing licensure in marriage and family therapy. And yeah, here we are. And what is a common theme amongst uh, maybe the people in your area of New York uh, when it comes to dating in the modern, modern age? Oh, gosh. I think... Uh, let's see, single people dating in New York, the biggest, I would say, hang up that people get into is this whole paradox of choice, right? That because of the apps, so, you know, the apps for everyone around the globe opened up so many more possibilities, right? For people that you could connect to, people you didn't know were available. In New York, because it's such a concentrated number of people in this very, so a geographically small area with an enormous number of people, you know, you could probably spend two or three days straight if you were on Tinder flipping through and not come across the same person twice, right? And then of course there's multiple apps and so there are just too many options. And so I think people kind of have that, that being overwhelmed by having too many choices. And so then you get caught in this whole, okay, so if I'm on all these apps and I know I'm dating people and then I'm gonna assume that they're probably dating all these other people. So how do I know where to commit my time to? And maybe I feel good about this person, but I don't know how they feel about me. And I'm going to assume they're probably dating all these other people. And so then I'm going to hold back because I think they're holding back. And, and it's funny how often I talk to people and they say, you know, the problem is we just get frustrated with this and no one actually ends up in a relationship, right? You could have casual relationships with 20 people, but never one committed relationship. So I would say that that's among my single personal friends and then also the therapy clients I have who talk about this, it's just a huge, huge issue. And I think everywhere deals with that, but New York is just such a concentrated place that I think it, it's that times 10. And, and how does that plethora of choices um, prevent us from truly making a connection with somebody else? Yeah, so there's this really interesting psychological phenomenon called the paradox of choice. Um, I, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, but to maybe, you know, um, the novice person. So it's this idea that we think we like choices, right? We do want choices. We don't like having our autonomy limited, but if we have too many choices, it actually impairs our ability to make that decision and to feel confident in it, right? So think about it this way. If you go to um, a restaurant that has a prefix menu, you have no choices, right? Maybe you like that, maybe you don't, you know? In some ways, it frees you up psychologically because you don't have to think about these other pieces of it. At the same time, it's constricting, right? Now, if you go to a restaurant that has, let's say, five, five right? You get some choice, but it's limited. And so uh, you're more likely to make that choice more quickly, right? As opposed to if you've ever been to a restaurant like the Cheesecake Factory or, you know, uh, 
the New York area uh, diners are very, very common, right? I think New Jersey's like the diner capital of the US or something, you know, and you have pages and pages and pages of choices, right? And so what happens? You end up flipping through all of these, you take much longer to make that choice. Maybe the, the uh, waiter has to come by a couple times to ask you what you'd like, you're not sure. Then you finally make your choice. And as soon as they take that menu away and you're thinking, oh my gosh, wait, did I make the right choice? What if I wanted this? What if I wanted this? What if I couldn't know? And so you have a lot more anxiety and you feel a lot less ground in the choice you made versus this place where you had five menu items and you probably came to that choice pretty quickly. And then as soon as the person took that menu away, you're like, I'm good. I got to choose when I wanted. I feel confident in it compared to my other options. You know, I feel very, very secure in making this choice. So there are a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, uh, side effects that happen, right, from having too many choices, uh, a lot of anxiety, just, you know, lack of agency, lack of self-confidence. Um, and so you could only imagine then when it comes to dating, how that plays out, because it's compounded, not only because do you have all of, you have the, like the Cheesecake Factory times 10 of, of options, right? But so once you finally found this person, they have to choose you too at the same time. So really, a lot of times it kind of feels like the stars just have to align pretty well for that to turn into an actual relationship. Mm -hmm. And is that the frustrating thing that people encounter um, when they've, they have feelings for somebody else and it's just not the right time? They're not on the same page. And then they're like, well, I don't want to get back out there and be stuck all over again, starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And a lot of times too, what will happen is that is a big reason too why sometimes people will stay in a relationship in which they're unhappy. They know they're unhappy. They know that this is not the relationship for them, but the thought of going back out there to that dating world where there are just so many choices and there's so many things feels so daunting that they will find ways to rationalize, well, maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe I can stick it out, right? And it's always fascinating on the therapy end because I will hear a client saying these things and in my mind I'm like, no, 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 you know, this is not worth it. Um, but they kind of have to come to that. And, and again, some of the things that people are willing to rationalize accepting and being okay within a relationship to prevent going into dating, it's, it's really baffling sometimes. Mm -hmm. It sounds like both single people and people in a relationship can have anxiety around relationships. Oh my gosh, of course. It's, you know, it's so interesting because I think people think once I get in this relationship, we're going to have it figured out. It's going to be great. We're, we're going to know each other so well. And then if we've been married, we're definitely going to know each other. But the thing about relationships, just like us as people, right, we're always evolving and changing and your relationship is too. And so the way to find that kind of lasting love and that lasting uh, in love, passionate feeling is to continue to explore that as though you're still dating this person, right? To always be curious about the world and to make sure you're checking in. I've had couples who've, who've been married for, you know, a couple decades and they come in and they sit on your couch and they tell you things and you're thinking, you know, it seems like these two people don't know each other at all in this way. And it's kind of fascinating. How could people who are so connected in these other ways and probably finish each other's sentences, right? Or know what one slight, you know, nonverbal hand signal means, but yet in other ways they're so disconnected and seem like they're complete strangers. So really you have to continue being curious about your partner. And yeah, I mean, this anxiety exists in dating, in relation, in new relationships, in old relationships, in relationships that are ending. I mean, I feel like as a species, we're just, uh, <laughs> We're pretty future focused and sometimes that uh, doesn't always benefit us. Yeah. If somebody is experiencing anxiety in a relationship, outside of a relationship, uh, what's a good way to begin addressing that with their partner or somebody that they're interested in um, getting to know better? So can you, can you tell me a little bit more about what kind of anxiety you mean? Could you give me maybe an example? Yeah, it comes from the example that you were talking about earlier of like meeting somebody on an app and you're just assuming that they're also talking to 20 other people or dating four or five other people. And if they're having this particular individual is having anxiety around those thoughts, maybe overthinking it a little bit, how do they approach that person and say, hey, you know what, this is what I want. And I just wanna check in with you and say, I wanna know what you want too and who else are you talking to? Who else are you seeing? What you just said? <laughs> 
Um, but the thing is, I think that people are so reluctant to ask that. And right, and what you just said is it's a very direct, but also very generous and unassuming question, right? Of saying, here's where I'm at. I care about you. Um, I'm curious if you care about me in the same way, if you're wanting the same things that I'm wanting, where this is going to go, because I want to manage my own expectations, right? So that is a clear, you know, you're being clear about where you are, what you need to know, and, you know, the information you're hoping to get, right? And you're not making assumptions about the other person necessarily, or you're giving them the flexibility of answering you, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is that so many people are terrified of asking that question. And when I, I'll ask them, be like, well, why are you so afraid to ask that? And what makes that such a scary question? And the answer 99 times out of 100 is I'm afraid that they're going to say they don't want the same thing, right? I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected. I'm afraid that's going to scare them off, right? I'm afraid that they don't want the they same thing I want. We don't feel the same way about each other. And, and of course, as they're saying it out loud, you can see the wheels turning and they're like, oh, well, if I'm afraid to say that, what am I really gaining? And it's like, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. right? But but this is kind of what happens. We hold back because we're so afraid of just being honest with the other person. Um, but to do that, you have to have a level of, of comfort with yourself and knowing where you are and what you want and being willing to then have that moment of vulnerability, right? Where if the person rejects you and you don't, well, rejects you, right? Um, if they, if they don't necessarily want the same thing you want, right? If they don't give you this ideal answer that that's not going to crumble you. Right. But that can't come from them. That has to come from something within you. You have to have done that self work enough to be uh, securing yourself enough that their answer is not going to crumble you. And if they do say, I don't want the same thing you say, okay, thank you for your honesty. I can move on and I can feel hurt, but I'm not going to feel crushed. I love that. Absolutely. And you said, a key phrase that I've been using a lot recently of managing our own expectations. And if we, if we put it in the context of say like dating from an app or meeting people on the app, because you can meet somebody online, but dating them online is the worst. So we're going to take it offline as soon as we possibly can. But oh. I guess <laughs> I get asked this question of like, well, Dave, do you, do you like me uh, after maybe like one date? And I'm like, all right, let's back up just a little bit. Um, when I met you on the app, I got curious. I was curious about learning more about you. Uh, let's say we went on a first date. Um, I'm a little bit interested in getting to know you. Those, these are the levels at which I'm kind of progressing through if, if the attraction is there and if there's a spark or if there's, like I said, the interest is there. Sure. And then a couple dates later, then that question can come up of like, hey, you know what? I, I am enjoying our time spending together. Uh, would you like to have the conversation about where we stand? And it kind of clears the expectations and it eases the anxiety as opposed to like me just spiraling these thoughts and overthinking everything. Exactly. And that's kind of the thing, right? Is that we have to be willing to have that vulnerable moment with somebody, but you have to also be aware of when is oversharing oversharing right and when is it okay to have that moment you know is it okay for someone after one date with you right and assuming you know your your first date is probably meeting for coffee or a drink or something right you've probably spent maximum of like a couple hours with this person you don't know them and so this the kind of ambiguous do you like me well what does that mean right <laughs> but also too you know um is that appropriate for someone to be gauging um, if you're going to be in a relationship long term, of course not, because you don't have that established history. Um, and you don't know if this is someone that you can be vulnerable with, but also they shouldn't necessarily be trying to kind of force that vulnerability onto you. You know, forced intimacy is not a good thing. Um, you know, Brene Brown has this quote that I love where she says, oversharing is not vulnerability, oversharing is armor. And that's kind of an example of that, right? We've probably all been on dates with someone who, at the end of it, we're kind of sitting back, you know, we're physically leaning away because we're like, that was a lot of information. Mm -hmm. right? The person who comes on so strongly and they're saying, you know, I want this and I want a relationship and I want to know if you want that too. And that's fine to have after a point in time, right? After you've been seeing each other for a couple of weeks or something, and you want to, you want to pose that in a very gentle, inviting way rather than as a demand. Great. After date one, maybe not. 
Are, are you saying that you've experienced that too? Like where your body language is like, now I'm stepping back. Wait, I thought, I thought as coaches or as therapists, like we had it all put together. Oh, right. We're impervious to, uh, to, you know, bad dates and making mistakes. And yeah, we're just like these heavenly beings sitting on high up here right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually really funny. I, someday maybe I'll write a book about what it's been like to be single as a couple's therapist because holy moly <laughs> and I'm sure you've experienced this too right uh people always have an interesting response to you when they think you're in some position of expertise in this role um and they're meeting you for the first time um a lot of times actually I used to tell people you know it's like I'm in healthcare I'd say I'm like a, a product manager just to avoid having to say I'm a couple's therapist what um, what product are we managing? <laughs> the product of people's lives. <laughs> people's relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah, or like, I'm managing the project of my business, my, my practice. Um, or, you know, just healthcare. And, well, that's kind of vague. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're dating your business, I think is what you said. Yeah, exactly. I'm dating my, I'm in a very committed relationship with my business. <laughs> And that's a great place to be at a certain point in our lives. And if that's your intention around dating, then I say have at it and go for it 150%. Right, exactly. I mean, it's not necessarily saying that you're so open to dating people at that point, but, you know, comes he comes up. But um, <laughs> back to your point, though, about, um, you know, what it's like when you're having the, I'm leaving <laughs> physically leaning back. Um, and you've probably experienced this too, right? You know, that sometimes you can be in a in a situation where you're meeting someone for the first time or after a date or two right and you're realizing they're doing this overshare thing and maybe you're usually a pretty open vulnerable person and you find yourself physically doing that um sometimes we have this tendency to self-check ourselves and saying why am i the one leaning back like oh my gosh am i being too closed off am i being too avoidant am i you know not open to this but I think one of the really great litmus tests for if a dynamic works, right? Because a relationship takes two people. The relationship is the space between the two of you um, is thinking about, okay, how do I feel about me when I'm with this person? If I'm physically leaning back and I don't like that I'm doing that because that's not how I like to present. That's, that's me knowing that I'm uncomfortable. Maybe this is a dynamic that's not working because whatever this person has going on, whatever led to that overshare or whatever's going on, it's making me feel uncomfortable enough that I'm noticing my nonverbals changing, right? So in that space between, that person might not be giving me enough space for me to feel like I'm comfortable enough to lean in like I would want to, right? So maybe this isn't the person for me and that's okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, you're staying present to the moment of doing a check-in with your own body language. And I've been there before, for sure, 100%. I can, I can remember a time where I'm just like, you know, I haven't said a word in like 25 minutes, but there hasn't been any <laughs> pauses in the conversation or what conversation that may be. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I think that you and I probably have this experience too, where, you know, we're in fields that, and, and love my job to pieces. If I won the lottery tomorrow, I would not change what I do. I would just travel more. But point being, um, love what I do. But when we're in these fields, right, where we're talking to other people, where we're in this helping role, it's wonderful, but we're so hyper responsible for other people that we don't necessarily get a lot of outlets to be able to share about ourselves, right? And so then when we're in personal relationships, we have to be really, really careful about the personal relationships that we choose to make sure that there's reciprocity there, right? And so if you're on that date where you, this person's spoken for 25 minutes and you haven't gotten a word in edgewise, you're probably going to feel even more drained than an, another person would maybe because you're like, listen, I've been doing this all day where I've been listening to people, I've been helping people, I've been available to them. I really want this to be something where we're available to each other. So right now this doesn't feel great. Mm -hmm. And I say that again. Sorry. I'm sorry. Does that fit with you or how you feel about that? Maybe I'm projecting. A little. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I love it. I absolutely love it because it comes back to the point you were making of like one person and another and the timing has to be right. And in that in that instance to likely be on the same page the odds are not high 
and yeah. that that might be a, a signal flare maybe on the first date of like the re reciprocity is just not there or um, maybe they do have a job that they're just so burnt out from talking all day like a teacher or like yourself who's a, a counselor who has to listen all day and then um, no chance whatsoever to be heard. Exactly, yeah. And, and that's the thing is I think sometimes, I love having this conversation with my single friends when, when we almost talk about the difference between a good date and a bad date. And I think there's really fascinating differences among genders and sexual orientations, that kind of thing on this and what makes a good date, what makes a bad date. Um, and I think for a lot of people, uh, especially for a lot of women, you know, a bad date means this person is like a terrible human being and whatever. And a lot of times for men, it's like, well, there, there was fine, but there was no chemistry, right? So you can know that someone's a good person and maybe even have a connection with them, right? You know, there's something about you that you feel drawn to them, but it might not necessarily be in a romantic way. You might not have a romantic connection with this person and that's fine. It doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that in that specific context of romantic relationship, that doesn't work, right? Um, you know, this has happened to me a few times where maybe I've been out with somebody and I, I can tell that there's a connection there. I, I really like the conversation, but for probably a number of reasons, I don't think it's a fit romantically. And I think that, you know, at that point, you do have a little bit of an onus to tell the person that, but you can give them the invitation for friendship, right? Um, and to say, you know, I think that there's a connection here. I would like to continue to have you as a presence in my life. I don't know if it makes sense in this way. Would you be okay with it being in X way, right? You give them the permission, right? But it means that you can still have that door open for some form of connection, but it's just not necessarily that you're going to sleep with each other. Uh, so contextually, that necessarily wasn't a bad date. It just didn't result in um, maybe meeting our expectations of romance. Exactly, right. So, so I think in so many contexts and relationships, we just have to not have such a narrow view of what success or failure is, right? Why, do, why does a date that doesn't end in you getting into a relationship and eventually getting married and then dying together, basically, you know, why is that a bad date or a failed date? It's not, right? You can have a great date with somebody and it not lead to a relationship and that's okay. I uh, completely agree. I, I've just been sitting here thinking about a quote unquote bad date that I had where, um, you know, I know like you, you're just all in and you're leaning all in now. <laughs> That's funny. Um, a great conversation, super intelligent woman, very beautiful, talked about work a lot, which I can relate to because um, I'm a busy business owner of three businesses and I stay, I stay pretty fast paced all the time. And good conversation. And I thought to myself, you know, like, Dave, don't think ahead of yourself. Don't get ahead of your, yourself and say, am I going to see this person again while you're on the first date? Actually, like, sit with that afterwards and say, like, if I'm, if I'm waking up the next morning and I'm thinking of you, maybe we'll go out again. But it, why it ended up being a quote unquote bad date is at the very end, before we even stood up from coffee, she said, hey, how did I do? <laughs> wow. It was almost like, um, okay, was I being interviewed as your coach the whole time or were we on a coffee date because our, our communication, our mixed signals were not getting us on at the same page? Yeah. Can I, can I ask you a little bit of a, a probing question? Is that okay? Sure, absolutely. Okay. So for you, right? Because clearly that was like the, the cutoff, right? The, okay, and we're done here, right? You know? <laughs> Um, but what was that for you? What was that turning point for you um, in terms of when she said that, you know, what triggered you to say, okay, this is an absolute no for me? Actually, it was really funny is um, I didn't say out loud that it's an absolute no for me. Of course not. Um, what I did is uh, something that I don't normally do. And, and I attribute this to a lot of the, the work that I've done and the growth that I've tr uh, really, really tried hard to do for myself is I I sat there and I thought about the situation for a second and I didn't have to come up with like an immediate response of like oh I don't know how you did I haven't evaluated it yet I wasn't sitting here evaluating you and judging your performance the whole time I didn't have a rubric I was checking off yeah right so like there's no checklist in my mind uh, 
So I sat there for maybe two or three seconds and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to sleep on it. And actually, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Wow. That's great. And how'd she respond to that? Uh, I think that um, the reason why we didn't go out again is just the, maybe um, the feeling I was getting of uh, needing to perform or needing to uh, kind of validate or see an evaluation at the end of the date. Like um, a lot of people are very success driven and they want the grade or they want the, they want the feedback. How did I do? How did I perform? And unfortunately, I'm just not going to be romantically involved with somebody who needs external validation all the time. Can I ask you why? I mean, you know why, but. Mm -hmm. So in a practical sense, or maybe in a, like an analytical sense, I'm not very good at words of affirmation. I'm not. It's not how I receive love and it's not how I give love. If we're talking about the five love languages, putting it very simply, um, on an emotional and like a kind of a gut feeling kind of way is like, well, validation doesn't necessarily come from external sources. It, it's got to come from me. And if I'm the person or one of the two people in the relationship that believes that to be true, then unfortunately, it's not going to be a synergistic, reci reciprocal relationship for long term. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that it's obviously all the work that you've done for yourself is wonderful. And it shows so much in that because that's exactly what I heard in that when you were talking about this. Um, and I wanted to get your, your feedback before I go and you know, project all the things that I'm hearing in it. <laughs> Why not? Um, <laughs> I have a very self-deprecating sense of humor, and I can't tell if you, you know, get that New York sarcasm. That was um, actually really funny. It was well-timed. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm so glad that you said that, right? That it clearly is reflective of this person's probably a little bit more of a fragile sense of self, and that it's going to be too draining for you to need to give that person that validation all the time. Because yeah, when she's asking, how did I do? You're not the one performing. She thinks she's performing. And also, that means that she's not paying attention to you. She's paying attention to her, right? And even though maybe she doesn't mean it to come across that way, you know, that means that it's the impetus is always going to be on taking care of her and that kind of thing. And, and the thing is, when you're in a helping role and you naturally know how to step into that caretaking place, it's great because you're very good at doing it. We tend to repeat these patterns and step into these roles that are so familiar not even if we like them but because they're just so familiar right we repeat those things so it would have been easy to step into that because you probably know how to do that pretty well to at least you know give her not even necessarily the words of affirmation right but know how to help her to give her feedback in a constructive way that she's also going to like right but it doesn't leave room for you and that's going to leave you depleted and you know, you've clearly done some new work for you to be able to see that and to say, you know what, that's not going to work long term. Because also then when you say, and this is what happens with people in helping professions a lot. And I know I work on this and really figure out my own things in, in dating relationships is that if I'm so used to being the helping role and I find people that like, you know, the helper, right. And they like being helped there's going to come a time and day when I need that. I need that support and I need the validation. And then those are the people who kind of throw their hands up and they're like, Whoa, what are you doing? And then I feel bad that I asked for help. Right. I feel bad that I needed something. Right. Because they're used to being on the take. You're used to giving and they don't know how to flip the role when you need that. I, I love it. That's an excellent explanation for me. I, I totally understood it. And, um, it was, how I was feeling sure when I was talking. Now, if somebody's listening right now and they're thinking, well, wasn't Dave just kind of projecting his shit onto her? What do you, what do you say on the other side of, um, let me rephrase, how do we sit at that same exact situation, process how we reacted to it and decide or understand that we are not projecting my stuff onto her? Well, here's the thing. We don't know her side, so we have no way of really knowing that. All you know is yourself in this because we don't live in her head. And also this person isn't sitting next to you to say, for us to check in to say, 
what was this about for you? You know, and to have that, that uh, the conversation that includes the two people, right? To talk about what happened, that dynamic. So in truth, we don't know that you weren't projecting that. However, I think what you're doing is you're actually, projection is when you are taking something within you and you're project and you're kind of putting it on this other person, right? And you're, so, you know, if I say, um, if I tell my partner, you're a messy person, but I'm really not liking that I'm messy, obviously a very silly example, right? That's what projection is. I don't know that this is projection on you because you're not projecting onto her a need for external validation. In fact, you're kind of doing the opposite where you're saying, I'm seeing that in you and I know that that's not a fit with me because that's kind of not in line with my values and the work that I've done because I've worked really hard to not seek that external validation, right? So again, it's one-sided because we're getting your side, not hers, but I wouldn't necessarily use the word projection in that sense, you know? Now, if it's a thing of like, well, Dave, maybe you were misinterpreting what she was saying. Again, maybe, but we don't know that without talking to this person. All we can go on is saying, this is how I heard that. This is how this made me feel. So regardless, when you get to a certain place in a relationship, you can have those check-ins and talk about that and get the other person's feedback and say, okay, what fits with my narrative? What fits in yours? Where do I need to maybe be flexible? But that's not the case here. Cause again, this was date one. So <laughs> it's okay to be a little bit inflexible sometimes because if you have those kind of record scratch moments on date one, where you're like, Whoa, wait a sec. Maybe that's a sign that again, like you don't necessarily need to go on, you know, 17 dates to figure out, okay, I really can't stand every part of you. <laughs> the record scratch moment. I like that. Um, I'm, I might actually insert that um, sound effect right then and there into the, into the episode. No, I won't do that. But you actually do it on your dates and like record the other person's expression. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> what just happened? Um, I do like New York City. I've always had a uh, fascination and kind of a long distance love affair with New York City as a cultural part of our of our country, as well as like uh, the sociological just fascination of putting that many people in the in such a small area, like you said earlier. So I watch How I Met Your Mother quite a bit, and there's an episode where the glass gets shattered, and it's a sound effect in the episode, and it's just like all of everybody else's perceptions are shattered when that flaw is pointed out. Mm. And I'm going to have this um, kind of soundtrack running in my mind of a record scratch or a glass shattering on my dates from here on out. There you go. But I think again, that is you being honest with yourself about what those things are for you because you could try to rationalize, okay, maybe the glass shouldn't, maybe I should unbreak this glass or unscratch this record, or I should find a way to be okay with this, these things in this other person. Maybe, right? And again, there, there are certain things you can be flexible on, but you also need to know what those hard boundaries are. So what are your record scratch modes? What are your like glass shatters, right? And that's okay because not everybody is meant to be, you know, have that romantic connection with you and having a lasting long romantic connection with you. And if you've had a dating history where you've been in long-term relationships and you know what that's like, um, and you've done the you work to know what you're interested in and know what you're looking for long-term, it's really, really okay to be more discerning and to not have that many second dates, not that have that many third dates, right? Or, or you know, these kind of in-between things. I think that there's a big difference uh, between people who are, are newly into adult dating versus people who've been on the scene for a little bit. And, and a lot of that you are a little bit more rigid in what you want. That's not a bad thing. I totally agree. And, and sometimes outside looking in, people would be like, oh, you're too picky. Or uh, maybe you should lower your standards just a little bit in order to get into a relationship. And I'm not taking that person's advice because they don't have any letters behind their name, uh, such as yourself. <laughs> you know, I got really good advice once from my counselor. Like, Dave, don't take advice from somebody who doesn't have letters behind their name. Well, okay. Don't take advice from everybody that does have letters behind their names because sometimes, you know, psychologists like to say nonsense things and make up words to make other people feel less smart, which is also nonsense. So actually, you'll love this. Um, if you're a Brene Brown fan, you'll, she's again one of my girl crushes, her and Esther Perel are, you know, the, the ladies that have my heart. 
Same um, over here. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> um, Brene Brown, if you listen to this, um, I love your soul. Um, anyway, so she has this thing she does, and I've actually done this with people too, um, and I need to do it for myself, where she talks about this, right? So the people whose advice you should listen to, right? The, the people that should have a say in, are you being too picky, are you not? That should fit on about a one by one inch sheet of paper and front side only, right? And those should be people that you know have your heart, right? That don't love you in spite of your imperfections, but love you because of those things, right? The people who are going to be authentic with you and they will be kind, but they will also give you the hard feedback in a way that's palatable, right? They're not going to judge you. They know how to do empathy correctly with you. And they know your story enough and you've had enough moments of vulnerability and trust building that they, they've earned their right to be on that page. But again, it should be about a one inch by one inch little square paper where it can fit maybe three or four names max. Hmm. I love it. The power of five. I think if we're coming at it from a business sense and I do love Brene Brown, I do love Esther Perel and uh, you said something in there I actually want to ask you about that somebody who's been on the scene for a little long, uh, maybe a long period of time. Um, and if we're talking about attachment styles or attachment theory, um, Amir Levine says that avoidance stay in the scene longer than anxious and secure. Uh, what's your take on that? Are you familiar with uh, attachment theory? Yeah, I love attachment theory. Um, it's something that I incorporate more and more into my work with individuals, with couples. Uh, there's so many theories now that, especially within couples therapy, that are based on attachment theory. So it's great. And Attached is a great book. It's wonderful. Um, you might also like Hold Me Tight by Sue Johnson because she talks about, um, that's a little bit more once you're in a relationship, but it's about um, when you have these moments of, of kind of getting off kilter a bit with somebody, how to reset a bit. And it's all attachment based. So all of emotion focused couples therapy is attachment based. Um, lots and lots of theories are, are, are using that because there's so much of it that not only makes sense, um, it's applicable. And there's also enough fluidity in it in, in new attachment that we can understand that it's, you know, it's not like a death sentence, right? Um, if you're on one of the more insecure sites and which is great, right? It's not, it's not static. It's something that's fluid. And it changes depending on the relationship that you're in. Um, but to then answer your question about avoidance, staying on the dating scene longer versus anxious, it depends on the person, really. Um, I think you could make that argument that avoiding people might be on more of the apps and take a little bit longer to have the where is this going conversation that, you know, define the relationship. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, like, let's not categorically say, you know, good, bad, right? Um, just like an anxious person, maybe they'll get into a relationship quickly, but that also might not be a good thing because if there's someone who jumps from relationship to relationship because they can't stand to be alone and because they're looking for that person to fill this need, right? And it's much more about the, the validation and seeing myself as being more whole if there's someone in my life and not caring about who that someone is, that's not good either. So again, a little bit of both. That's why, um, you know, we all kind of vacillate between somewhere on the spectrum of attachment at any point. Um, and that's okay. It's, there are certain things where if you have an overly anxious potential dating partner, you might act a little more avoidantly. And maybe that makes sense given the dynamic, right? So, um, you know, so we're talking about the dates where you're physically leaning back. They're probably leaning more anxious and we're probably leaning a little more avoidant in that specific scenario. But there's a reason for that. It's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, the reason why I asked that question as a differentiation um, between we were talking about having high standards and being too picky, and that's not necessarily correlated directly with an avoidant attachment style. It could be if it depends on what you're being picky about, right? And and if you're being picky about your hard boundaries, right? Because you said, okay, here are my values, right? And um, I'll just I'll use an anecdotal example to kind of hopefully paint this more clearly, right? So one of my val one of my core values is you know being kind and compassionate, right? So when I was looking for a partner, 
finding someone who was kind and considerate and compassionate, right, and was respecting my boundaries, that was on my list, right? That's that's kind of my hard boundary. And you know, if you if you can't meet me there, that's going to be my glass shatter moment, right? That's going to be my record scratch. Where I'm like, okay, nope, not going to work, right? Um, and and that kindness, kind of, you know, again, being, there being a reciprocity in that, right? So if my, if my avoidant, my, so that would be something that's okay, right? That's not being avoidant. That's actually just being um, more secure. And again, knowing that someone who's going to violate that in the beginning, that's not going to be something you can fix later on. Um, so there, there are certain things kind of in your core that you need to be aware of that are your hard limits and be okay with walking away from those situations when someone kind of bumps up against that. That's not making you avoid it. Now, if your avoidance is after three dates, you're like, well, she had her hair in a messy bun because she met me right after the gym and oh, I just don't like the messy bun look. Okay. Yeah, you got to check yourself in that situation because uh, a yoga bun and a, and, a, and a gym bun, I mean, that's pretty high up on my list. Of the yes, I want this or the no, I don't. <laughs> well, I think it resembles more of like the comfort level between two people of like, you know, she values my time, she values hers. And the only time that she could get together was right after the gym or yoga class. And we're still having authentic conversation. And he, she was like making an effort to still be present. And like, I'm, I'm not superficial and neither is she. And she can show up on a date with a messy bun look. And um, it's almost more endearing than um, the 100% all the time makeup look. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I think that says a lot about what you're looking for in a partner and how much introspection you've done and kind of self-reflection, right? And actually saying, you know what, I'd be a little more put off by the girl who looks like she just left Sephora every time, <laughs> you know, um, because why does she need to project this much perfection, right? That much perfectionism is, is usually a little more indicative of someone who hasn't necessarily done that reflection work. Um, and that's not a good thing because that's not going to line up with where you are. So it might be a perfectly lovely person, might not make sense for you for a long-term relationship. What even weighs more heavily, and you were touching on it just a little bit about your core and your values. If one of my values is exercise, nutrition, a fitness-based lifestyle, then I will respect the messy bun straight from the gym um, coffee date more so than like um, it took two hours after the gym to actually schedule a date because we need to prep time. Exactly. exactly. Again, not, not putting like a value, not putting like a, a judgment on that person. Um, it's just some, it's not a hard boundary for me where I like, oh, we have to look a, like a dime couple every time we go out. Exactly. Right. Or yeah, exactly. So that means that again, you're being more fluid in that way, which is indicative of someone who's more secure, not anxious. Now, you know, again, the anxious one, if we want to take it outside of the, you know, the realm of, of physical appearance, right? So let's say I'd gone on a date with, or I'd gone on like three dates with somebody and everything was great, right? We we're having a great conversation. I felt that they were kind. I felt that they were being honest and genuine. There were a lot of things that were checking off my hard values list, right? So there've been no record scratch, glass shattering moments, right? Everything's going really well. And then, you know, we go to order food or we're like at a taco place and, and they don't like cilantro. I love cilantro. Is that going to be a record scratch moment for me? If I use that as my record scratch and be like, oh, no, right? You know, or they don't like spicy food or something like that, then I'm being avoidant and I need to take a look at me and say, okay, we know that that's not a real thing to, you know, you can, you can clearly work your way around that, right? So if that's something where this is something that's a pattern for you, and again, it's going well, and all of a sudden you're looking for that little thing, you're like, oh, see, nope, can't do it, right? Then you're being a little avoidant. And that's not necessarily a good thing, but it's also something that if you are self-aware enough and you're willing to do the you work and be reflective, you can figure that out, right? Um, so to, to be a little self-disclosing, I'm, um, I'm in a fairly new relationship. Um, and in the beginning, I was the one who was being a little avoidant. And one of my very good friends, who, who's actually on my, you know, on my very small list of people who get to have an opinion of me, um, we were talking about about something, and I was I was saying something ridiculous, you know, about like, well, I don't like this, so I don't think it's going to work for this reason. And luckily, this friend looked at me and said, Meredith, you know that that's a you thing, right? You know, you know that that's just you being avoidant. What are you actually afraid of? And made me sit there and talk it out and say, okay, here's what it is, and okay. 
so maybe you should talk to this person about X and figure it out. And, and we did, right? And it was fine. But that was a real check moment where that, that friend needed to give me the feedback to say, this is you, this is not them. And I needed that feedback because if it had been a friend who wasn't on that list, right, they could have very easily been like, oh my God, what a jerk, that's unlivable, that doesn't work. You should definitely get out of that. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have necessarily been the correct advice for me, right? You know, but this was a friend who knew me well enough to say, I think you need to look at you right now. That's awesome feedback from a friend and a trusted source. That's awesome. Um, when we pick the little things to avoid and like run away from, and we're just like, we're not looking at ourselves. The same can be said about avoiding the first conflict in a relationship too, where we're like, this is a big deal but I like this person enough to actually kind of want to work through that. And then there's, they're like on the brink of working through it, but then they still run. So uh, what I'm, what I'm kind of doing is the polarity between running because of the little things and also running to avoid the big conflict too. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing is I think that, and I hear couples say this all the time and even, even people are maybe considering leaving a relationship and, people make the mistake of thinking that the frequency of arguments is somehow indicative of relationship health. And that's actually just not true. So it's the course of the conflict and how you're arguing that's indicative of health or, or lack of health in a relationship. Um, because someone who's completely conflict avoidant, that's just as unhealthy as someone who's having these knockdown drag up fights, right? It's, it's kind of the opposite side of the same coin. Absolutely. And um, I think that how the conflict gets resolved is a good indicator of the health of a relationship and your willingness to invest into it in order to um, res uh, basically come out of it. Oh, absolutely. And so this is actually something I will tell people uh, when they're newly dating somebody. So when I have clients who come in and they're like, oh, I've met this person, they're wonderful, da da da. And okay come back and let's talk about this. I hope it keeps going wonderfully for you, but let's talk about this once you have your first conflict with them, you know, because listen, when you're agreeing with somebody, it's so easy to be happy and to feel connected when you're not disagreeing about something, right? But, but when you have that moment, um, you kind of have that sliding door moment of, okay, where's this going, right? We disagree on this. How do we then go about it, right? Or we see the situation very differently. Um, how we resolve that and how we talk about that together, how kind we are to one another, even when in conflict, that's indicative of whether or not this could be a long-term partner in that way. You know, if this is someone who's very blaming, who gets easily defensive, who can't take responsibility for what they've said or done, uh, who refuses to acknowledge your point, that's maybe not someone who's going to be a good partner long-term. Yeah, been there before. Yep. Now, the other side of that, though, <laughs> check ourselves, right, is that, you know, if we're going to expect that from somebody else, we have to be willing to do that, too. So um, I was actually thinking about this with, you know, with, with my new partner who, um, you know, I, I got a little, like, not super upset, but I got something bothered me and then, you know, had to think about it and whatever. And I realized, you know what, I'm, I'm the one projecting. I'm the one the wrong here. And so I think that I have to be the one to apologize sometimes even more because this person expects that, well, you're a couples therapist. Like, I'm a little afraid that I'm going to mess up all the time. You're never going to mess up. So it's almost more important sometimes for me to be the one to say, you know what, I'm really sorry, right? Or I read that wrong. Um, I, I took that the wrong way or whatever. Or I wasn't being generous in my assumptions with you. Um, you know, because if I'm going to ask that of this other person, and if I'm going to hold them to a certain standard, I have to be willing to do the same. Yep, absolutely. Uh, 100%. Well, I know that your time is valuable and I want to say thank you once again. Um, I hear that you're going to be in the area mid-October. Yeah, I'm actually coming out to Denver um, mid-October. So uh, just, you know, for a weekend. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, if you've got some free time, let's grab coffee. We'll do a little face-to-face -face and we'll extend our conversation. What do you say? Yeah, I would love that. Let's absolutely do that. The power of social media connecting us through Instagram and then bringing it full circle to a podcast episode. And then um, if you've got the time, I'd love to connect in person too. Of course, that would be really wonderful. Thank you.
Um, if your message resonates with somebody today, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Sure, they can go to the website. It's www.relationshipcounselingnyc.com. Uh, you can also send an email to our general uh, email account, info at relationshipcounselingnyc.com. Um, there's, there's also links there for um, other things we've got going on. Uh, so it's not just me in the practice. I've got some other therapists who work for me. We're all actually marriage and family therapists um, in some regard, and we have different specialties. One of our therapists is a Gottman Method trained therapist, and he's actually hosting a couples workshop coming up on October 5th. Um, that would be really, really great. It's kind of, if you're not necessarily in a place of wanting to do full-fledged couples therapy, but you wanna just maybe be a little more proactive, gain some communication skills, it's really, really great for that, especially for the value, um, because it's a one-time thing, um, and you're not necessarily committing to like long-term therapy, but you're actually getting the benefit of learning from the therapist and having this therapist help you and your partner to make sure you're practicing this in a way that's gonna help you uh, kind of concrete those skills that you're learning and then take them from the room and apply them in your relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of the Gottmans, absolutely. And uh, I know another one of our uh, guests on the podcast, Nick Mancini, is also a big fan of the Gottmans. Um, and I cannot wait to have Jamie on as a, as a guest of the podcast. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Of course, yeah. I really, I really hope it works out. Jamie's lovely, and he's our assistant practice director. Um, he's a really great entertaining person and has just such a wonderful way of helping couples to talk about these very, very difficult things and helping to have the, you know, these often fraught, contentious conversations in a way that's so palatable and makes it, you know, he's so disarming, um, his presence. And I think it'll be a great conversation with you guys. So I really hope that works out. Yeah, me too. Same. If there's one thing that we didn't touch on or that you wanted to expand on today and leave us with, what would that be? Oh gosh. Um, hmm. I don't know. Um, what about you? Is there anything that comes to mind for you? And maybe I can, I can. Um, yeah, we were talking about um, stages of a relationship and when it's all new and it's all fun and it's all sunshine and rainbows and roses and things like that, we almost feel as if like we've arrived and because we've, we've found a person that we actually want to be with. And when we want to extend into a lasting love, long-term relationship, we have to understand that there's no such thing as, well, it's called the myth of arrival. And we, we're still not arrived once we get into that relationship. There's still so much work to be done. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Yeah, and, and I think this, this did kind of trigger a thought that would be really, I think, good to leave on, right? Um, we have to stop looking at relationships. I would say in any context, romantic, family, friends, whatever, right? We have to stop looking at them in such categorical success or failure terms in terms of, okay, if I meet this person and we're dating and, you know, we fall for each other and we're attracted to each other, but it ends, that relationship's a failure. That's such a limiting view. Um, and I don't think it actually helps us. We have to be a lot more flexible in that, right? So what if we're in a relationship and we didn't make it to the funeral home together, um, but we learned a lot from one another, right? We, were, we learned a lot about ourselves. Um, we learned things that were important to us. We learned new things about the other person. We learned new hobbies we liked. We learned about, you know, changes we wanted to make in other relationships, right? And so maybe this person wasn't our forever person, but they helped us to grow. Can we count that as a success? And I think that if we can be a little more flexible in that, um, it actually gets you a lot closer to finding that lasting love because you're not putting such rigid boundaries on yourself where you end up limiting and counting out things that are actually important and then also cutting off things too quickly. Um, so, you know, if we can kind of leave on one thing, I would say, you know, be flexible, be kind with yourself and with other people. Very well said. I can't thank you enough for sending us off with that, uh, with that sage advice. So thank you, Meredith, once again. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you. My pleasure.